Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Alumni Leadership Conference. I'm John Chisholm, your president and chair for uh, FY16, and I'm thrilled to be here and welcome you this morning. Over the next two days, you'll have the opportunity to connect with other alumni leaders uh, and uh, discover other members of our incredible, great community. Uh, you'll have a chance to reconnect with MIT and uh, discover the some wonderful talents of our fellow alums, share your own talents, and learn uh, how to better contribute uh, to uh, build our MIT community. My goal is at the end of the conference, you'll feel energized and motivated to take what you've learned here and discover it and bring it back to wherever you're from and share it with our fellow alums there. Um, along the way, I, I'm confident you'll discover new nuggets that will be of value to you, uh, discover new ways to engage our fellow alums and new ways to build the virtuous cycle among our alums and with MIT. I hope you have already downloaded the MIT ALC mobile app uh, for iPhone or for Android as well, is that correct, Christine? Uh, if you haven't done so, you can go to the App Store or Google Play to download it. Feel free to do so now. Again, it's called MIT ALC 2015 app. It is the best way to make connections uh, with your fellow attendees to get alerts and updates, manage your own conference schedule, and get immediate session feedback or give immediate feedback. One of the very cool features of MIT alum, uh, ALC 2015 is its recommendations. Uh, it recommends other people who are here that you should meet based on your LinkedIn profile. Matches up all of our LinkedIn profiles and sees where the greatest commonalities are. I've been matched up with uh, uh, Damian Fernandez, who I already know, and two people I don't know, and so I'm hoping to meet when I'm here. Uh, Pierre-Jean Henand and Marty Breton. So if either of you are here, please find me and, and come up and say hello. Uh, to kick off our conference this morning, we're about to hear from an MIT faculty member with uh, Professor Marty Culpepper, SM97, PhD 2000, who has the unique title of Maker Czar for Mechanical Engineering. Marty received his BSME from Iowa State University and his MS and PhD from MIT. He then managed his consulting company before returning to join the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering at MIT in 2001. He is the recipient of the National Science Foundation Presidential Early Career Award for his work in nano manufacturing equipment and instrumentation. He received two R&D 100 awards and a TR 100 award. His research group here works on the science and engineering required to create new meso, micro, and nanoscale positioners for biomedical imaging and nanomanufacturing. MIT has more square feet of maker spaces, uh, that is places for building, uh, equipped for building things, than any other university in the world. And the institute is revamping the way these spaces are used. Marty believes that making things is a key to innovation and is vital to the real world success of MIT students. He'll share how alumni can contribute to the future of MIT's culture of hands-on learning and will bring us into these spaces so we can see firsthand what our students are creating and learning thanks to these unique resources and share with us how alumni can become involved in the success of current students and the Institute as a whole. Please welcome Professor Marty Culpepper. Good morning. You guys are a little rusty. Let's do that one more time. Good morning. Good morning. All right, that's better. Uh, name is Marty Culpepper. I have the title Maker Czar in Mechanical Engineering um, because our students build a lot of stuff. And about two years ago, we were finding that the students weren't building enough stuff. So they needed to put somebody in charge of making sure that the student had access to all the machines that they wanted to, et cetera. 
And what I learned during that experience was that mechanical engineering, we build so much stuff that we actually spill out into all the other maker spaces on campus. So then I got roped into, uh, unwittingly, but happily, uh, dealing with a lot of the other maker spaces on campus. All right? We're going to talk about maker spaces on campus today, the way the campus is, the way our peer universities are, and the way that the maker spaces on campus need to change for the next 10 or 20 years, all right? So why does making matter? How many mechanical engineers are alums? Aerospace, chemistry, architecture? Where did everybody else go? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe the sugar and the caffeine hasn't kicked in yet. All right. Course six, my bad, my bad. <laughs> there we go, okay. <laughs> that was a Freudian slip as a mechanical engineer, I forget. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna walk around here in front because if I don't walk around, <clears throat> I'll get antsy, but um, why does making matter, all right? I think most of the folks that raise their hands, they've probably seen the equation for thermal, diffusi uh, thermal diffusivity, so transferring heat inside of a material. Does that ring any bells or PTSD or anything like that? <laughs> All right. Do you, when you first saw it's a differential equation in time and space, when you first saw that, did that make sense to you? Don't lie. I see some people, <laughs> just, it makes sense to nobody when you first see that equation. All right, this young man, it made sense to him <laughs> right off the bat, okay? So that equation on the left-hand side, that describes how heat energy moves through an object, and that pull, and I know some of you have done this, and we all know what's gonna happen, and people try it anyways, okay? Um, that describes what happens. The, the pole has a high thermal diffusivity, it sucks all the heat out, and then all of a sudden you're frozen to the pole, okay? So you can show somebody that equation all you want and try to explain what happens, but actually the experience of getting to see those things work in real life is important, all right? I think it was Mark Twain that said, the, the man that carries a cat by the tail learns to never do that again, or something to that effect, okay? All right, so this is why MIT has over 130,000 square feet of maker space. That is a little bit over two football fields. I don't know of any place else on the planet that has that much space devoted to designing and building. All right, and I've traveled around to a lot of our peer universities. I've been overseas to look at places and see how they do this. And we're unique in that it's just so inherent in what we do that this stuff is spread all over the place. And that's a good thing, right? But that's a problem, too. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. Um, so this is why the MIT seal, this experience bit, this is why we have both the scholar and the smith, right? learning the nerd work, and then actually using it and seeing stuff work in reality, all right? This is what we do at MIT. <clears throat> so we have students, and in every school, you'll find people building. Doesn't matter whether it's engineering, school of science, architecture, um, humanities, you're gonna find the students building stuff and they love it, all right? You find students building things in teams, so solar car, FSAE, and it's not like they're getting credit to do these things, they're just doing these things because they love to do them. Building robots. Architecture. I've been talking with people in architecture and they have amazing shots. One of the other things that we do great here at MIT, and other places do it well too, but I've never seen any place that does it this well is the people that teach in our machine shops and our building spaces are by far the best I've ever run into. All right, they're not just technicians that work in a shop, they're educators as well. So, <clears throat> brings us to this point. A couple years ago, I had an MIT undergraduate come to me as a freshman and said this to me. And I was like, what do you mean? He said, well, I could build stuff in my garage and I said, well, you can build stuff here too. And he's like, no, I can't. And I don't mean to be all gloom and doom. The point here when I talked to him a little bit was, we have all this space on campus, but it's not the easiest thing to get access to. It's one thing to have a big shiny shop. It's another thing to get across the door to get in to use it, all right? 
And this will become important later, but essentially what we found is that the students right now face barriers to getting in the shop, and then even once they get in the shop and they want to build stuff, there are other barriers that prevent them from getting to make things, right? So I'm going to talk a little bit about the state of where we're at right now, the problems that we have. They're fixable things, and we're doing stuff about it, all right? And then at the end, we'll talk about how you guys can actually help us out, because we need your help to solve these problems. So uh, graduate students the same way. Now, Georgia Tech um, is one of the schools right now that is getting this right. They have probably the gold standard in design of building spaces right now uh, in the US. And some of their graduate students are coming to us now, and they're having trouble getting access to building spaces, whereas at Georgia Tech, they didn't have trouble. Okay. <clears throat> now, the nice thing about this is the problems are known. And we've started to address them. Getting students into the shops, we've actually started to ease that. But there's a lot more work that has to be done. So I think what this indicates is that we saw a problem was coming. We caught it early, and we're addressing it right now. All right, so let's take a look at what some of our peer universities are doing, just to give you an idea of where we stand relative to them. So at Berkeley, um, sometime this fall, they're supposed to bring online a large building uh, that's basically set up to be able to enable people to integrate their classroom learning, their hands-on learning, and then entrepreneurial activities. And this making of stuff is super important to innovation and entrepreneurship, um, because if you want to start a company, if you want to convince people that you're mitigating the risk, an investor, for example, you got to have prototypes, you got to build the stuff, and you got to test and see how the things are going to work, all right? Um, so if a student has a company, they need to be able to get into our building spaces, build their prototypes, fail fast, learn from that, and then get something that works well. Um, at other schools, they're taking the approach where they're starting to build these buildings and integrate you know, all of the different schools on campus, business, engineering, law, oftentimes, and then they integrate design, <clears throat> and they just put these things together, and it's like, um, it's the analogy of a rainforest to a cornfield. If you want to grow stuff like massively in parallel, you, you have a, 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 a cornfield, all right? If you want to grow stuff where interesting things are going to happen, right, not just the standard stuff, you want a rainforest, okay? The analogy here with these spaces is that they're setting them up, and on purpose, they're not saying, we're going to do this, 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 this in this space, all right? You don't need to tell the students what to do. The students are going to come, they're going to bring their own ideas, and when you leave them alone, amazing things happen, all right? So Berkeley is setting up a facility that looks like this. Georgia Tech has set up a similar facility. So it's called the Invention Studio. It's actually uh, was set up and it's run, uh, or it was run by one of our alums, uh, Craig Forrest. He did his PhD here. And Craig went there, found a group of students that were interested in being able to build things anytime they wanted to, got some space, and they built what they call the Invention Studio. That place right now, it's student run. 80 students volunteer their time every week to help their peers learn how to build stuff. It was amazing. When I was there, <clears throat> I went to visit two things. Uh, I walked in and I saw that sign. I thought that sign was really cool and snazzy, and I said, Craig, you guys, how much did you spend on that sign? And he said, nothing. I was like, what are you talking about? He said, I just came in one day and it was there. The students <laughs> built the sign. They said they wanted a sign, so they built a sign. And I said, well, what do you mean they didn't go through facilities? And he's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, the, the thing is, the students feel ownership of that space, right? They know that they have to take care of it and be safe, but they're really there because they want a place to design and build things and um, they take care of it well, all right? So they built that sign. The other thing that, was, that struck me when I was there is I, had, uh, I was standing there, and I saw a freshman walk in the door, right? You guys all remember what it was like to be freshmen, right? Walk in the door and sort of meekishly said, you know, my biology professor told me that I could come here, and you guys might be able to help me figure out how to make a model of the arteries around the heart. And the student, I think it was a sophomore or junior, just walked right up to him and said, yeah, sure, we can magic that into existence with 3D printers. And the kid looked at him, he's like, yeah, we'll go show you how to do it. Walked in the door and immediately got started on building stuff, okay? That's in stark contrast to a lot of other places across the world where students have to take training classes before you can even gain access. 
Sometimes it's weeks to months worth of wait. So we'll talk a little bit about Georgia Tech later on. Um, but Craig has done amazing things there. Case Western Reserve in Ohio uh, has what's called the Think Box. Now, Case isn't a large school, but man, the two people they have that are setting this place up know what they're doing, all right? So they are in the process of converting a cold storage warehouse on campus to a large innovation center, all right? That includes maker spaces, fabrication, all kinds of stuff. And we'll look here through the floors that they're building. Bottom floor is a place for people to hang out, which is super important to these places. Um, you want people to want to hang around. If they hang around, they form a community and they help each other learn, all right? Um, next uh, floor is collaboration, meeting rooms, whiteboards, and then you go up and there's a rapid prototyping floor. Each one of these floors is 7,000 square feet. <clears throat> go up to, um, whoop, did we skip? No. Go up to the fourth floor. This is more like a machine shop, right, where you have CNC equipment, routers. Project space where kids can just work and put things together, all right? Entrepreneurship, where they go to learn to start companies and they have local entrepreneurs that help them figure their way through the path to being successful. They also have lawyers that will sit down with them and help them with all the IP issues. It's amazing what they'd set up. And then they have an incubator up on the top floor where they pick some of the companies and they start them and get them launched, all right? Now, in everything I just said, I didn't, you didn't hear me say, we're going to do this class in here, we're going to do that class in here, we're going to do this activity or that activity, right? And the reason for that is if you build these things, it's like Field of Dreams. I'm from Iowa, so that movie is close to my heart. If you build it, they will come, all right? We've seen this at our peer universities, and we've seen it to some extent here at MIT. And that concept's a little bit foreign for people at MIT that we'd have a design and building space that's not really programmed, all right? Is one of the things that we're dealing with right now. So getting back to this, <clears throat> you hear statements that look like that. Not every student says this, right? So not all gloom and doom. But then you got to figure out what in the world are we going to do about it, all right? Now, you guys are wise enough to know that when I say we, that means you too, <laughs> okay? So we'll get to that near the end, all right? So we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on on campus. We did some diagnosis. We did the nerd work figured out what's going on, and then the solutions to it, and then we'll come back at the end um, to talk about some of the long-term plans. So this is only half of the bigger building spaces on campus, all right? I couldn't fit them all up here, just wasn't enough room. And in the beginning, when I started working on this problem, the students would say, we can't get stuff built, we can't get stuff built, we need to build more building spaces. And then people in the administration would say, what are you talking about? We've got more uh, maker spaces and, and machine shops per unit square foot than anywhere in the universe. Um, and I was fiddling around with this chart one day, <clears throat> and I decided to color code them, if you see up top, according to which spaces it was easy for the students to get into and which spaces were more difficult. And this is what we saw. Now, actually, most of them were red. And I had to sort of make some of them yellow for political purposes so people weren't <laughs> upset with me. <laughs> but the, regardless, the moral of the story, do you see the two green dots? Do you know what differentiates those from every other place on campus? Those are the only two spaces on campus, the, the major spaces, that are student run. If you go to MITRE's, the students run it, right? They do the training, et cetera. And the ME Maker works, they, that was started this summer uh, in response to this problem of people not being able to get access, and that is run by graduate students, okay? Now, we're not saying every space should be green. Some of them need to be red, right? For example, if you've got spaces where you're running classes and you can't afford to have people come in and maybe accidentally break your machine, you know, you, you need to have some barriers there, all right? But the point of this is, this, this sort of made everybody have the same perspective. Everybody suddenly was like, ah, I get it now, all right? So now we understand that the problem is access, all right? So we gotta figure out how to make access easier for our students. A little, a little bit more diagnosis, and this then is what we found. There are multiple barriers to the students getting into the shop, all right? Um, first off, even to this day, nobody knows where everything is on campus, all right? I'm finding uh, shops and building spaces that were here when I was a student that I never knew existed, right? Um, so we're in the process of cataloging all of those. Facilities has actually gone through and caught, uh, caught a lot of those. Um, the students, freshman comes on campus, doesn't know, is it okay if they go into this shop, all right? 
that's an easy problem to fix. All right? The training boundaries, right now to get trained, sometimes to get basic training, you're talking about weeks to months of time because there's so much pent up demand. It's actually started a negative sort of feedback loop where it takes a little while to get training, so the, stu the students, when they get on campus, everybody says, oh, it takes forever to get trained, go get on the list. So then they get on the list, and then the list gets bigger, and then, every then people say, oh, it takes so long to get trained, and then the list just grows, okay? Um, social boundaries, today the kids, you know, instead of going to a movie, they'll say, we wanna go build something. So they just go build, right? And you can't just walk into a machine shop and hang out with your friends when there's no places to sit or no place to get food. Community is a big part. When is it, when is it open? Everybody in this room, I know, when you were a student, you worked between the hours of nine and five, and then you went home, <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't understand what's with these kids today. It's like they stay up at late hours of the night. It's crazy. <laughs> um, somebody had done a study, and I don't remember the exact numbers, but you'll get the point. The, the internet and the power usage in the dorms goes up around 11 o'clock, and then it holds steady to, what do you guys think? three, and then it drops, all right? So their lifestyles are very different from us. I once had a student come to me, and he needed to get into the shop late at night, and I said, look, I, I can't let you, in, you know, into the shop. And you'll come, the shop's never busy at 8 o'clock in the morning. If I let you in late at night, you'll be tired, and you, it's dangerous to work when you're tired. He said, you, Professor Culpepper, you don't understand my life. He says, at 8 o'clock in the morning, that's when I'm tired, right? At 10 o'clock at night, I'm not tired, all right? So a lot of this has just been listening to the students. Right? And it's bore a lot of fruit, and we'll talk about this later on. And then what does it cost? Um, some students, um, we've taken some data, some students spend up for $2,000 a year just building stuff out of their own pocket. All right? If they show up to the machine shop and the shop says, we need a requisition to pay for time on the laser cutter or the 3D printer, the student's like, what's a requisition? All right? So there, we've got to solve that. So going from I went to make X to I made X, you know, that's not the easiest prob uh, thing for the students to do, and we need to make that easier for them. All right, <clears throat> so right now, my goal is I've got to get, there's almost a six-month lead time to get trained on some of the major making equipment on campus, and I've got to get that down to seven days, all right? It's going to take a couple years to do it, but we got a good plan. We have colleagues at other universities, and they are great. They've actually been willing to share how some of them do these sorts of things. Nobody has the whole solution. And so we actually have a group of universities that are sharing information so that we can all figure out all these problems. Everybody's having a similar problem because there are so many students coming into you know, the technical arts nowadays and entrepreneurship, and they need to build stuff. So everybody's experiencing, to some ex uh, extent, the same problems that we are. All right, let me talk about the different kinds of spaces on campus. There's a machine shop. How many folks worked in a place that looked like this where everything is gray except for the wood? Okay, this is a place where you got technicians that run it. It's, a gr it's great because they really know what they're doing. All right, if I need to build a part for a satellite and it has to be accurate to 10 microns and I need to fixture that thing and mill it, I can go ask Bill Buckley to help me do that. All right, <clears throat> so these machine shops, they're fantastic, but the problem is getting students access only scales with the number of people that you have staffing it. You can't have 30 or 40 people staffing a shop. It's usually just two to four or so. Okay, so the access of what, uh, the, the access scaling of that sort of facility isn't the easiest thing to do in the world, all right? And the types of activities you do, generally it's more like the metalworking or the woodworking, you know, more, you know, it's generally limited in terms of the, the types of things that you would do. All right, other types of spaces we have are project spaces. So this is a space that's associated with either a research project or classes. Right, so a lot of you, when you took your junior, sophomore level classes, you had these big capstone classes, they had spaces set aside for that. What do you think happens if they let anybody use that, that space and then all the mills get broken at the end of the semester? When you were a student, how would you have felt? Panicked, right? Um, so these spaces here, they're very good at doing what it takes to get students to learn through projects that are associated with classes, right? Or delivering on research goals. But again, the way that these things scale, you can't just let anybody in there. The way they scale is you either gotta let more people in to the classes or into the research program. Now you see this picture on the left-hand side? This is the Papalardo Lab uh, at MIT, and I'm pretty sure we're really close to fire load. The, the, what is it, the, the population rating for you know, uh, the fire department. That wasn't at the end of the semester, that was the middle of the semester. All right, a lot of our shops, especially in mechanical engineering, are at the breaking point. Um, 
Now the funny thing is, we'll see right now that this, the legacy of MIT, it's always been this fine detailed, hardcore, techy, gritty work, and then learning in classes, right? And kids have learned outside of classes as well. But we need to have more class learning and more general, <coughs> general access for students. And that brings us to what we call a maker space. So you'll hear, hear people say maker space and apply it to almost anything. The difference between a uh, maker space and these other types of spaces is that maker spaces are places that are run by communities, right? Instead of maybe technicians that run a machine shop, you have a group of people, so a group meaning a lot of people, that care for the space, they wanna teach each other how to, to make stuff, <clears throat> and they're committed to keeping the place up and keeping it running well, all right? These can be students, it can be faculty, it could be staff members, it doesn't matter, it's just a community of people. Now, in all of these spaces, they can all have the same equipment, all right? The difference is what they're used for and how they're run, okay? And that took us a while, a while to figure out. I don't, uh, and it, this gets to the heart of why we have the problem at MIT. So, do's and don'ts, some of these are not the most intuitive things for people at MIT. A lot of people want to program spaces with classes, right? They're always like, it, it's sort of like traffic, you know, you build more highways and you get more congestion, right? You have more spaces to run classes and what happens, the classes grow and the projects get more complex. So people are always looking for space to run their classes. In a maker space, this is just an area where you leave it open and then people come. If you're in a class and you need to work on your class project, come on in and work. If you are starting a company, come on in, right? If you're working on your graduate research thesis, not a problem, come on in. Doesn't matter what you're doing, you can come. All right. So the thing is, in these spaces, it's more of a flat sort of uh, a flat profile in terms of how people treat each other. There's not a lot of hierarchy. It's everybody is a member of a community, and everybody works to make the place work. Now we've seen these work at other universities. Georgia Tech is a great example. Stanford, to some extent, has a facility that runs like this. Case Western's facility, the one pre predating the new one they're building that comes online this fall, worked like that. Um, and we have some examples on campus here too. For example, the hobby shop, miters. There are some examples here on campus of that. But we need more of that space. So <clears throat> a comparison of a maker space versus, this is really David and Goliath. A maker space versus two of the big machine shops that we have here on campus. So the Georgia Tech Invention Studio with fewer people is able to, uh, and less space is able to serve the needs of more people because it's scalable with the community. They have 80 students that volunteer, basically, to help out and staff the place, keep the machines running. And it was interesting, I walked in there, <clears throat> and the same thing is happening here at MIT. The students don't like the way a certain machine runs, so one day I walk in, and there's this contraption built on top of the machine. And I'm like, what is that? And they're like, oh, we didn't like the way that this fed into the 3D printer, and so we just built something to fix that problem. And I was like, do you know that voids the warranty? And they're like, what do you mean it voids the warranty? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but they're, the, the, they're engineers. People forget these kids are engineers and scientists, and they're not children. They can work on these machines and fix them. Um, so you don't necessarily need somebody that has 40 years of experience to help keep a space like that. Now, at the same time, the technicians are very valuable because they have a high level of expertise that we need to have on campus. So we're, not, we're basically saying we have to have the right balance of those things. Um, that space had fewer safety violations than we have had in our big machine shops here at MIT. All right? And I find this across different schools. There seems to be a force amplification factor of somewhere between three to four in terms of space. Right? So the same amount of space if it's a project or a shop space versus a maker space, the maker space can be three to four times as productive in terms of the number of people that it serves. All right? <clears throat> so on campus right now, there's talk about building another large maker space. Um, that maker space would be around 20,000 square feet. All right? And the question was, was asked, you know, what do we do with that space? And so I went through the data that facilities had, and I looked up the square footage we have on campus devoted to shops, to project spaces, and then the maker spaces. And I said, access is the problem that you have, right? If you want entrepreneurs to be able to get in there and have access, right? If you want students that want to work on their hobbies get access, and if you have, if you have kids that are on teams like FSAE that need access, 
we need to build more maker space, all right? <clears throat> so right now, the Institute is going through a feasibility study on adding another 20-ish thousand square feet to that maker space bin, okay? That space, based on some preliminary calculations, should knock out that whole training backlog that we have, all right? That space will make it so that students can come in and within a week get started on making almost anything that they want. That space, if we're lucky, will be here within a year or two, all right? So what do our students think, all right? And I promise, I'm only, so I've gone a little bit to the nerd end of the spectrum. We've been talking about numbers. We'll come back in a little bit. You guys are doing great bearing with me, okay? So we did, I'm a precision engineer, and I don't like to do things unless I know what to do, all right? Not that I'm indecisive, I just like to know when I'm, that I'm always gonna be successful. So we did a survey, figure out from the students, what do they think about making stuff on campus, all right? And I'm just gonna walk you through some of the results that we got. Um, we asked them who they are, okay? And this is graduate and undergraduate students. We had a response rate somewhere between 10 and 15%, which is pretty good for a survey, all right? And it was actually done during the summer too, so that's actually really good, all right? Um, couple things to notice. I don't think that this is any surprise up here. Um, artist was one of the things that we didn't expect to pop up so highly. Um, entrepreneur, one in five, roughly. And that number, from what I've been told, is growing and not at a linear rate. It's more of an uh, exponential thing, all right? We're sort of at our breaking point right now on being able to handle the students that want to start companies, right? We're not there yet. We can do it, but we're going to be in trouble if we don't get this new big space online. Right? That's what's really going to be the workhorse um, for the entrepreneurial activities on campus. What do you like to make? <clears throat> so the three things right here that have arrows, um, two of those, whoop, I think this guy has moved a little bit. This guy is supposed to point to that guy. Um, you can do on computers. The other one was cooking. You guys heard of molecular gastronomy? Do you know what that is? Where they like make foams out of whiskey and it's just crazy. Not our students, just like <laughs> chefs do that. Um, but we have a lot of students, we have some students that have started companies selling food in the dorms. That's not what I'm talking about. This is like artistic creative cooking, like gourmet stuff. Um, all of this stuff that you see here, everything here is gonna be supported within that new 20,000 square foot facility, right? All these students will be able to do this stuff. Other than the other, we're not quite sure what that is. All right. Um, where do you make stuff? This raised some eyebrows. <laughs> so, <laughs> a good survey should always raise more questions than it answers. <laughs> and this did exactly that. Um, well, I knew ahead of time, that question had been asked before. So I said, look, that's great that we know that, but we need to know what they're building. And what it turns out is, you know, a good chunk of it is coding, but they're building furniture, like wooden furniture in their dorm rooms. Um, they're building gifts for people. They're, there's like anything you could build in the machine shops here, except for maybe like heavy metal stuff, they're building in their dorm rooms. People are building their own 3D printers and making stuff in their dorm rooms. They're buying 3D, you can go to Micro Center right now and buy a 3D printer. They go and they buy it, like a group of five of them go buy it, bring it back, and then all of a sudden they've got a little shop they set up. Um, in their dorm room. Other places, all right, so where my laptop is, that's not a surprise. Off campus is the next big one. Why is it, why, right? We speculate, we don't know for sure right now, but a lot of the students, like I said, have trouble getting access to the shops. Some of that trouble is perception, right? They just think that they may have trouble or they're worried about walking in and you know, interfacing with a 40-year-old crotchety guy like me, okay? They would rather be with their peers Okay, sometime. All right, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but these names should be, start to be, uh, we're getting into where these names should be familiar to people, hobby shop, the media lab, you know, the architecture shops. And notice that it's like not all that, there's, there's no spikes here, right? So the students are pretty well spread where, where in they're working. The list, uh, this is the ME Maker Works right here. This has only been online since the end of May, but already it's more than half the way up the list. There's another half to this list. All right, and that's because this is a student-run space, okay? So then MITRE pops up here, and then there's a bunch of other ones here, right? And the students, there's loads of places for the students to work, but they're really not focusing on any one space except their dorm room. Go figure. All right, um, hours, right? Most of the shops and project spaces, typically, not always, 
are open from eight to four. Look how many people like that option. That would have been, uh, I mean, you guys just told me that would have been fine for you guys. <laughs> but the kids nowadays, not so much, all right? Um, so what does this mean? Well, the machinists are technical specialists and you can't just go find them anywhere, right? Plus they need to be educators. So you're looking for somebody who really is a, a skilled craftsman at what they do and they also have to be able to teach. Those two things are hard to find and then you put them together, that's really difficult to find, all right? Well, why does that matter? Well, they have lives too. It comes five o'clock, they wanna go home and be with their family. So what are we supposed to do about the, you know, 4 p.m. to 11 p.m.? Um, this is where the students become important, all right? The students, they're adults, all right? And there are certain things that they can be tasked with and be responsible with and we've been able to show that and this is how we plan on getting some of those spaces open until 11 or midnight where students can work, all right? How much do you spend? So like I said, we have some people down here. I have no idea what it is they're building. I wish I would have asked that, okay? It's, I worry about if it's anything good or not. Um, but there's a, a big bulk of students here, you know, they spend a good chunk of money. That number 150, that, that grabs a lot of people. Imagine if we had a program where there was an endowment that paid out enough money so that every student on their tech cash card could have $200 every year just to spend on building stuff. They don't have to worry about their own money. They don't have to worry about requisitions. They just walk up with their tech cash cards. They want to use the laser cutter. They swipe and they go use it, right? It's one of the plans that we have right now. It's the idea of Provo Schmidt came up with that idea. I think it's brilliant. All right, so let's talk about what's next. So that's a little bit of background on what's happened, um, the problems that we face, why we think we have them. All right, so <clears throat> we're gonna talk about this new space here, all right? Some of the things that are going into actually planning that new space, all right? One of the things is that right now, students really aren't allowed to oversee other students sometimes because there's a lot of concern about people getting hurt. And that's understandable, okay? Um, the thing is, is that you cannot mix up real safety with regulatory issues and legal issues. The first thing to do is make things safe in the first place, and that is taken care of by training, all right? Now we have students, you know, our students are 18, 22, 30 years old, uh, especially the graduate students are 25 and up, usually, and they, these are people, you know, it's hard for me to tell somebody that came back from serving in Iraq that you can't be trusted to go in and use a machine tool because we're worried that you can't be safe with things, all right? So, and I don't mean to be flippant about that, it's just, you know, within any population, there's a Gaussian distribution, you have some of those people that are gonna be really good at being safe and being able to help other people learn, and our task is not to worry about the tail end folks, it's to find the people in the middle and to be able to identify the tail end folks that might not be so good at safety and to make sure that we keep them safe. That's our job. All right, <clears throat> so let me play for you real quick a video. So this is an experiment, that new 20,000 square foot uh, space I'm talking about. This is that space in small, all right? So it's 1,500 square feet. This is a space that um, 40 graduate students are helping us run right now. In the course from May till the beginning of this semester, they have trained 300 some students to use a machine shop. That is more than the other big training programs on campus all combined. So this one 1,500 square foot space versus the other 129,000 square feet did in three months what the other spaces take a year to do, okay? So the students came to me and they said, we need a place to build. I went and I visited Georgia Tech. I saw what they had there. I literally came back and I was like, mind blown. I went to my department head, Gong Chen, and I said, Gong, if we don't do something about this, we're gonna be in big trouble. And so Gong and I, this is a computer room right next to the LMP manufacturing shop in building 35. <clears throat> the students helped write a grant. We got $200,000 for equipment. Um, the Martin Trust Fund within the Sloan School, you know, we've been talking to them a lot about helping their entrepreneurs and, and business folks be able to prototype things. They kicked in money, School of Engineering kicked in money, the department kicked in money and put in space, all right? <clears throat> some of these folks are construction folks and some of them are students. The students ordered the machines, brought the machines in, the students wrote all the training requirements, 
The students went through, they maintained the machines. If it goes down, they fix the machines. They train each other, they train themselves, and then I actually do a check off on every person once they've been trained just to make sure that that's all working properly, okay? So right now we have 40 graduate students helping to set up that space. And the students that I talk to, they love it because they can come in, it's open late at night, they just go talk to a student, they say, I need to 3D print something, and, and they look, there's a badge that they wear, and if there's a sticker that says they've been trained in 3D printing, they just go right in and they print, okay? So this is our uh, small version of in part what that large version might be. That's actually Aaron Ramirez, he's the pr uh, student president of that space. He's doing a fantastic job. Now, <clears throat> the students that run this space, um, I was very clear with them, this is an experiment. You guys are, are the spearhead for MIT in doing this, and just don't mess it up, right? <laughs> um, but at the opening, Provost Schmidt came. What he saw this, he liked it. Uh, the chancellor's been through, the deans of engineering, um, uh, architecture have come through. A lot of people have come through. We've had, there were so many people coming from outside of MIT now to tour this space that I had to hand that off to the students. I just was unable to continue to do it. Um, we have people asking, the students wrote uh, a minimum and necessary set of documentation um, for how you run a space like this and how you train people. We have people from other schools asking about this, and it's great. It was funny, because the, the faculty can use this place too, all right? And all the students, when I sat down with them to interview them for positions, and this is one of the key things, is you have to find the students that are committed, that really are doing this because they want to help other students, and that they're safety-minded. So there's this long interview process we go through. And I said, you know, you're going to have faculty members that work in this space, and they're going to show up like five minutes before closing, and oh, we got to get this thing done, I've got a blah, blah, blah tomorrow, and you're going to have to tell them no, right? And you should have seen the look of glee in their eyes. <laughs> they're like, I get to do that? I was like, sure. And they're like, well, what if they won't listen? It's like, we well, have my cell phone, and there's a kill switch on the wall. <laughs> they're doing a fantastic job, okay? All the, I think all the shops on campus actually are doing a fantastic job. It's just we've been set up with shop space and project space which has worked in the last several decades, but now we need to transform to have more maker space. All right, so plan, plans for the campus. Um, a lot of places around the US right now are building these larger buildings. What they're typically doing is they may have a few building spaces on campus and they're, they're just consolidating them, all right? And then they draw a box around their campus and they're like, this is our campus and here's our building stuff, okay? When I took a look at it, I had a different take, okay? And what I said, well, what we really have on campus is a bunch of little building spaces that just aren't connected together, all right? So somehow we have to find a way to connect them together. For example, the water jet goes down in my facility. The, you know, I should be able to reach out and ask, say somebody, say, look, we got a student that has an urgent job. Can you help us out? Right now, that really doesn't exist, other than informally. Um, we should be able to train a student in one space, and that training carries over to another space. Right now, we don't have that. If you get trained in one space, you're sort of pigeonholed there. And if you want to go someplace else, you know, if you're lucky, the guy at the shop that you were at will vouch for you and maybe they let you in, but oftentimes you have to go get a specific training for that space, all right? Um, and then there are the hubs. So Vladimir and Fiona and I and some other people have been working on these innovation hubs on campus. This would be the hub on West Campus, which is this large 20,000 square foot space I'm talking about, okay? On East Campus, they would have another hub that's smaller but the moral of the story here is the west space would be more engineering and technical centric, and the east space is going to be more uh, uh, entrepreneurial and innovation centric. Now we'll have elements of both on both uh, at each place, all right? <clears throat> so we'll have maker spaces there, we'll have maker spaces here, and then the two of these spaces have to work well together to make sure that if the students over there don't have the equipment they need, then we can get them uh, over here and they can get made what they need to get made, all right? But beyond that, if you're a senior and you've 3D printed something 150 times, is printing that 151st part really gonna, are you gonna learn anything from that? Probably not. Do you need to clog up the MIT system which should be devoted to helping people learn? No, not necessarily. So there's porting out to local vendors that are trusted where we can have an easy means of sending them information to get parts made and get sent back quickly with high quality for the students so that they don't have to make everything from scratch. And then there's connections with other schools. Metal 3D printers, is one of the things that we and a lot of people in Boston would love to have, but they're almost a million dollars and they require a lot of upkeep. If we had one of those, let's say at MIT, we could share that with the other places, we could also share the cost, 
All right? So the approach here is more of connect everything in campus, don't just consolidate stuff. Leave it distributed because that way we can uh, focus on the, the local populations of people, serve them the way that they want to be served, and then make connections outside of campus that help us out, all right? Other things that we're doing right now, these individual boxes on campus where the making happens do a great job, but we really don't know what's going on. We don't know who uses them, what they're using them for, and so we've got a project or a program right now where we're getting ready to put basically iPad minis on the door with a Google, spread, uh, Google form where you just walk up and you say, this is my ID number, I'm here for hobby work, I'm in the Department of Architecture, and then you hit send, and then it just collects that. So we know how the spaces are being used, all right? That was easy, cheap money. Uh, was easy and not a lot of money to deal with that. Other things that we're doing. So this maker passport, this idea here, solves the problem of getting trained in this shop, and then you can't go over to this shop to work without more training. So the idea is if you get trained in the water jet, you get a stamp on your digital maker passport, you walk over to this other shop, they can scan the QR code on your phone, and then they can also see the notes that the shop person left about you, right? Now this, <laughs> which <laughs> is important for the tail end of that Gaussian curve, okay? <laughs> now at the same time, too, the students get to review the shops. So you know like on Amazon, how you have five stars and all that sort of stuff? So the students get to review the, uh, the shops. Um, and I know that things are working right when people are always excited and a little bit uneasy, right? So both the shop people and the students are a little uneasy about this, but it really will work in the end. The Maker Bucks program, this was the idea of the endowment that pays out that $150 to $200 for every student, right? <clears throat> We're gonna call this Maker Bucks. it runs on tech cash. And then there's Mobius. If you guys remember, sort of the first box that I had up here that said nobody knows where everything is, Mobius was started to fix that. So it's an app on your iPhone, and I'll play a video here and I'll talk. I'm actually gonna mute it because I think my kids are screaming in the background. So it's not the best quality, but I think you'll get the idea. So that first box is, you know, where is everything? So we've cataloged some of the major spaces. We're still cataloging them and adding them. But you can get into the Mobius app, and then you can search. If you want to find a laser cutter or a 3D printer, you just type it in. The map pops up eventually. A map pops up, and then it shows you where those things are at. It tells you what hours they're open, who to contact in the shop to get access. It tells you, uh, my dream is to have it tell you their favorite type of donut, so you can show up properly prepared, OK? <laughs> Um, so, for example, here it's going through, and there, you can search by the kind of machine you want. You can search by, you know, the shop. You can search by material. It'll tell you what kind of materials you can cut, the kinds of things that you can make on it. So this is that maker works for the students, right? It says, look, you want laser cutters? These folks have two of them. Then you can go in and you can see this is the kind of laser cutter. These are the hours that the place is open, all right? Gives you an idea of who can use that space, the capabilities of the machine, and you know, the, the group that's most excited about this is the machine shop people, because they're like, gosh, I didn't know that so-and-so had a machine like this, now we can ask them if we can use it, all right? It's really simple to, to get this rolling. Now, the Mobius app is also gonna include the Maker Passport, the Maker Bucks. Um, it's gonna allow students to schedule machines, right? There are a lot of different things that that is going to do. So that helps us with the connectivity between the different spaces, all right? Um, so we've had it tested by students. We ran and got, this is the beta version, ready to go in June, and the provost office just released the funds to get the consultants running on it, and those guys are off and rolling like, like mad, all right? The idea is that most of this stuff will be ready to roll by December, all right? What else is it looking for? Yep, so I think this is a water jet. So you see that little offline symbol? It'll let you know if the machine is down. So you don't have to walk in February in 12 feet of snow all the way across campus and show up because the kids don't use the phone anymore, all right? Um, and actually, it's hard to get people on the phone in the shop because they're, they're working so much. All right, so does that look familiar to anybody? You guys all remember that? Right now, it is still there. Right now, we're doing a feasibility study to determine whether or not this could be converted into a dorm in a makerspace, all right? So I don't think anything's set in stone. I don't want to freak people out that are in that building, but the moral of the story is that's a lot of space, okay? I've toured it, and it's an awesome place for a makerspace, all right? 
So that's where the Met is. We've got Mass Ave here. This is Vassar Street. Uh, we're over here, all right? And sort of floor planish wise, that building is long because it's actually five buildings side by side is what it is, all right? So forget about all the stuff that you see inside of this outline, but here's one building, here's a second, a third, a fourth, and a fifth. And then there are what? Five floors, I think? So on the bottom floor, the space that we're talking about, the bottom floor is going to be this building, this building, and then part of this building. So like, it's almost like half of one floor of the Met Warehouse. All right? So they just redid the outside of that building a couple years ago, and the inside's really solid. I've walked through it. So if they decide to do this, it's something that can be done very quickly. All right, All right a little bit more here. <clears throat> so if we, we've laid out, with the help of talking to students and people that run the machine shops, what is it that you'd like to see in that space, and how would you like to have it laid out? And the evolving concept that we have right now that a lot of people like, I'm not going to read through all of these, but basically a lot of open space to work, right, areas for staff to watch out and make sure everything's safe, flexible meeting rooms, your, your common things that you use to build uh, metal and wood stuff, rapid prototyping stuff like 3D printing and laser cutting. This here, light and photo, do you know that that's one of the most popular things? Because the entrepreneurs, if they've got to make a video, where do they go to do that? They don't have anywhere to go, right? If they want to take high quality pictures, so that solves that problem. Um, because we're all technical folks, scientists and engineers, you don't only want to just make things, and this is one of the ways that our maker spaces here at M MIT are going to be unique. You don't only want to just make things, you need to be able to measure them and make sure they work, right? So metrology and measurement is a big part of making that happen. Build it, measure it, it blows up, go back and build another one, okay? And then some of the, the dirtier stuff over here, like sheet metal and welding, and then bike repair actually is a big thing. The, the funny thing with kids nowadays, like when I, uh, I started doing this sort of thing, because I just took my dad's carburetor part on his car, and when I put it back together, there were mystery pieces left over. I got, <laughs> <laughs> I got busted, I didn't know where they went. Um, but I was just the type of person that would just go do, right? The students nowadays, we see that more of them need to be drawn in. So a lot of people have bikes, right? So to draw them in, you say, hey, we have a bike repair place. So they come in, they start working on their bike, and then they see all this other awesome stuff. They see people 3D printing stuff for their bike, right? Um, another thing at Stanford and actually Artisan's Asylum here in Cambridge, they have jewelry making, which is another draw, and then electronics like Arduino. So this space is set up to handle all of that sort of thing. To give you an idea, square footage-wise, this is my Mustang, and so that's like 100 square feet if you look from the top down. So that's, you can actually drive a car through this space. And then it'll be open late. Um, it'll be staffed, the idea is uh, by a, a community of technical people, so they have the high-end high, high end skills, and then also by students who are master makers, okay? So again, we'll be able to cover all of these sorts of things within that space. And these are some artist renditions for what that might look like, all right? So on the bottom floor of the Met, there would be fabrication on this end, there'll be some other commercial stuff on that end. And then on the top four, the idea is that this is where we'll integrate that uh, entrepreneurship and in innovation, okay? So if you think about Case Western, where they have this flow up through the seven fours, so about 50,000 square feet, we're just gonna do it bottom four and top four and put all that square footage there, all right? A lot of people are excited about that. The students, uh, some of them that are close to graduating are a little, <laughs> never mind, I'm not gonna talk about that. All right, so, um, why does making matter, all right? Experience is important. Our students should have the best of experience both in their classes and their research work. Um, they should be able to go in there. I, some of the best learning I ever did was when I was just making something because I needed to or I wanted to. And they should be able to go do that almost any time that they want within reason, okay? This is why we have all this space. There's a better way to use it, all right? So we've done the data analysis. We've done the nerd work. Uh, we've done the men's part of it and now it's time for the manis part, all right? So we're gonna do the hand, all of the working with our hands to make this happen, all right? This is what we do. We need to be the best at doing this sort of thing. Other schools are getting really good at it, all right? I think even with some of these buildings the other schools are building, they still won't have as much space as we have, and I think the way that we do some of these things is, is uh, better than other schools, right? I'm, I know that sounds incredibly modest, but I'm just, it is what it is, okay? But there's a lot that we can learn from them. 
right? And actually to get that student maker space running in mechanical engineering, the 1,500 square feet that I showed you, that space is helping us learn how to program and run a big MET space. The only way I got that started was I had to go down to Georgia Tech, visit Craig Forrest, a friend of mine and an alum from here. He showed us around. I brought two of our machine shop people because nobody on campus thought that this would work, all right? They saw 80 undergraduates running this facility, fixing the machines, building stuff, training other students, and the students were super responsible, right? So I came back, I told my department head, he, uh, uh, and this is a, a lot of credit to him, he just said, you know, we're strapped for space and money, but we're just gonna do it. He said, Marty, go, he said, we're gonna do it, so Marty, you go do it, right? So I went out, and with his help and the students' help, we got the thing running, okay? Learned a lot from it, and the idea now is that we need to replicate that across campus, all right? And then with the data analysis that we do and talking to the students, working with them to figure out what for the future is the right mix of shop space, project space, and maker space. Right now we're heavy on the first two and we need to be a bit heavier on the last one. All right, so again, we come back to then the end of the talk. Um, what are we gonna do about it? <laughs> um, to be honest with you, the, we need to have, uh, we have a big committee right now of students, faculty, and staff that are helping to program that space, figure out the machines we wanna have. We need to have alumni on that committee as well, all right? Um, people that are experienced um, in understanding wh why and how it is important to build things, how that helps you when you're at school, and then when you leave here, why and how that's important, all right? That space, a lot of, there are companies that haven't even been started here at MIT off of inventions that'll change the world, and the first you know, product serial number 001 will be made in that space, and we need the alumni's help to help us make that happen, okay? I'm not gonna talk too much about fundraising, but uh, it's not like this is five or $10, okay? I know the folks in, within the institute that do fundraising are working on this as well, and my guess is that you may hear from them uh, asking for thoughts or for some help with this sort of thing, okay? All right, so that brings me to the end, all right? I... <laughs> You're good? Okay. So, uh, long story short, the way that people build things in engineering education, technical education, has changed, all right? The students have changed, and the system we have here has been awesome at it for years. It's still good at it, but we need to get ahead of everybody else for the next 20 years. So I think I was supposed to get done at about 10 o'clock, but like a typical faculty member, my clock runs five minutes fast. Yep. The, the are That's good, because my motorcycle needs to be moved before 10.15, or it's going to get <laughs> a ticket. <laughs> well, it needs to be moved shortly after 10.15, all right? Okay, so uh, thanks for your attention. I guess we will take questions if folks have them. Oh, okay, let me actually see if I can step up here and get out of the lights a little bit. Who's, who's got the microphones? All right. What do you think? I see, I got you, all right. Are you there thinking you... about ways to tap alumni energy, uh, you know, pay for a maker passport or involve active local alumni in the space? Uh, yeah, in the smaller maker space, we've started to recruit local alumni to help advise the students and actually to help recruit. One of the things the students want is they want people to come in and talk to them about what's going on outside of MIT. And we find that our alumni are the best ones to help us do that because they understand what it's like to be here and they can help to screen and identify people. Um, so that's one of the things. The students are also teaching classes. Like we, um, we have some alums at 3M, and the students are teaching you know how to properly bond and glue things together. So we put you know we go to the alumni at 3M and we say, hey, can you guys help us out? Right, that sort of stuff uh, is super valuable. Now, to be honest with you too, you know just figuring out what was the problem because a lot of people have been talking about this for many years. That um, it was just me and my admin doing that, and she is on vacation this week. I think she's had it with me because it's been so much work. Um, there are other things probably we'll be looking for alumni to do. It's just, you know, we haven't had the time to actually lay out a whole program for how to involve the alumni. I wish I was able to do that by today. It's just we're, we're not there yet. All right. Marty, the other question's over here. The other microphone's over here. Go ahead. Yeah, um, hi, I was really glad to hear this because there's also a lot of alums that are in the maker movement 
you know, um, I have a consulting firm that helps uh, K-12 schools build maker spaces, and there hasn't been a way for us to find each other or to have any kind of events. It's sort of been seen as part of K-12, but it's not, as you appreciate, it's different. So there needs to be a maker um, interest group, just like there is for K-12, I think. So if we could have that, I think we could really help you. Yeah. So <clears throat> some of my colleagues at the other schools, for example, Case Western is very good about this. Case is plugged into a lot of maker communities. So there are maker architects, there are maker uh, folks that just do um, uh, software, there are maker cookers. Um, they're really tied into those people. And they've got lists of, I don't know if you would call them, yeah, they're communities, communities of people that are interested in making. And I'm pretty sure when I was there, I saw a community of folks that does the sort of thing that you're talking about. Um, so one of the, you know, for K through 12. So I can actually put you in touch with them, and then they can help point you to some other people that maybe experience the same problems that you have. Now, another thing that we're doing, um, a group of us, I had been traveling around and asking people questions about how things work there, and they were asking me similar questions. We realized people at different schools had some of the solutions or had certain things solved and other people didn't. I said, this is crazy. I'm tired of flying all over the place. We're all just gonna fly into Chicago on this day at 10 o'clock in the morning. We're gonna meet for six hours, and then we're gonna fly out, all right? Um, so we did that. We got funding from the Innovation Initiative, and then uh, here at MIT and Stanford, uh, through VentureWell, kicked in the other funding. And what we resolved to do out of that was write a book of how to make and run your own makerspace. So this would be for schools, uh, for universities, colleges, and then K through 12 at the same time. Now also, you know, if you're interested in that sort of thing, we've got branches out to some of the local uni uh, universities where we just had a K through 12 tour come through our space the other day. Right? We can help to hook people up so that they can go tour these spaces and learn from people locally that have been running them for a long time. So that was a long answer, but I hope that that answered uh, your well, question. Well, my question was a little different. I've already written that book. I want to find the other people, or a book like it, and I want to find the other alums who are doing the same thing. Uh, so what you're asking about is, is part of this whole thing, connectivity between alumni. So between alumni who are doing this and people who are here at the Institute already, because I've already written that book and interview a lot of people, and I'd be happy to give you one. But, you know, <laughs> or you can buy one, even better. I'll give you a card after this. But you're volunteering to the committee. I, I think I just volunteered for something, but that's bad. That's but, but anyway, I want to find you all. So here I am. Find me. <laughs> all right. Did we have anybody else? Yes, sir. Um, so first off, just thank you very much for taking the time to you know tell us all about this uh, you know cutting edge expansion of, uh, of you know opportunities for the students on campus today. Um, so you said that the Emmy Maker Works space, the, in, you know, the initial funding for that was, if I recall correctly, a combination of department, institute, and uh, some grant uh, funding that uh, was pulled together for that. Mm -hmm. Once you move forward to the, in the medium and term, uh, medium and long term uh, plans of having uh, some additional east and west campus maker spaces, potentially even the, uh, the warehouse conversion. Um, what would be the funding structure that you would envision uh, to keep this going on an ongoing basis? This is a good question. So there are two parts to that. <clears throat> the Maker Bucks program, right? So every student has on their card 200 bucks to spend. They go to Facility X. They want to use a water jet. They swipe it, right? It charges them the standard MIT rate for water jet cutting. And then that facility gets to keep a chunk of it. Uh, just a quick question. On the Maker Bucks, would the 200 come out of their, would be part of uh, their tuition, or no, how would this, that No, this is money given to them, it, and it can only be spent on making, all right? So this is every year the students just get this. They show up on campus, and ka their account has the money in it, all right? Swipe it, a portion of that goes to the local facility. That facility gets to keep that to help run their facility, all right? The second thing is, and I spoke with the students, the, the ME Maker Works, I spoke with them, and I said, you know, long term, you guys have to be viable in terms of helping yourselves, right? You can always ask for donors. You can always ask the department. I said, you know, one of the things you guys could do is during the summer teach a rapid prototyping class for one week, and they did it. This summer, we had 20 people come from various companies. So this is a, um, a professional education program. Learned from me and the students, and it's $5,000 to take the class, so that was $100,000 that the students brought in to help um, maintain their space, right? 
there's a lot of demand for that sort of thing, right? Within, and it's uh, within, you know, for example, alumni, and then just most of the people that we had come, I think other than 20, maybe three were alumni, and the rest, you know, had been someplace else. Um, but that's not a group of people that's gonna get smaller as time goes along. That's a group of people where there's gonna be more. So that's another way to, to help with the, the funding long term. And there, I mean, there are the other usual mechanisms as well. Cool. Thank you very much. I have a question slash suggestion. In that app that you're developing for finding the machine tools, are you gonna have uh, a functionality to it to, for the kit so the students can track their routers, their bill of materials, and hence project costs, because that would certainly actually allow you to collect a lot of data on what they're doing, what they're building, and yeah. they can also learn the economics of manufacturing. So. Yep. So that, uh, so a couple interesting things. Uh, we're, you know, some schools let them do whatever they want and they don't charge at all. Right. And then you have people that spend $50,000 building some crazy gadget, right? So we're purposely limiting them so that they have to think about what they right. spent, right? The, uh, and then more direct, directly to your question. Um, the, what we've done is we've laid out, you know, sort of in order of priority, you know, what things are on fire right now and need to have water thrown on them versus gasoline, and then what things that come after that that are important that need to be done, and then other things beyond that. The, um, the, the key things we're focusing on right now are those barriers that we talked about. Those are the key things that prevent the students from getting in there. So we're focusing on those right now. That's going to be the next year to 18 months. And then after that, once we have all that solid and it supports the students making, then I think it's a good idea, the things that you talk about, like helping them manage their making, building things like that in, I think is a great idea. It's not something that we're going to be able to get to in the you next 18 months. That's a good months, entry so. point with the app, so that's a great place to start. Yeah, yeah I think so. There's a, and one of the beauties of that is there's a lot of stuff that you can do with that app, right? I mean, it's very easy to add things on as long as you're careful and you don't crash all the apps simultaneously. So, all right, thank you. Other questions or? Okay. I'm actually pretty loud. So <laughs> okay. <laughs> but the, uh, what are you looking at as a budget of this? I mean, I just did the math. I'm getting about 800000 a year for your maker bucks. Yeah. That oh, that's totally right. That's why the endowment, and I'm not a guru of endowment mathematics by any means. But when we had the discussions, we did the same calculation. It's something like $35, $40 million, something like that. So if you count undergraduates and graduate students, right? So it's, it's almost $1.5 million a year, almost doubles it. Does that make sense? Yes. OK. One more question, I think, and then. Uh, professor, can you quickly discuss uh, your program's interface with IAP? Say again? Independent activities period, your interface with the IAP effort. Oh, so my personal interface or the whole effort? The whole effort. Everything. Um, we haven't interfaced with any, there are a lot of places specifically on campus, right, that we could interface with. IAP hasn't been one of those things where we build an interface to because our purpose right now is to make this available generally to anybody, right? So if you're in a class in the fall or a class during IAP, you know, you can come use this facility. All right. I think the exception to that was that we didn't have what we should have in terms of the link between the business school and the engineering school. And so we've spent some time building that bridge and actually helping them build a makerspace in the business school. Um, you know, the uh, IAP program, there's also the, the teams um, uh, and clubs. That's another program that has similar activities that you might find in IAP. We haven't yet gone the route of getting involved with them because you can only split my admin so many ways and you can only split me so many ways. So it's sort of been this thing of order priority. Now, eventually, what do we want to do IAP-wise? Um, a lot of the training, I would say about half of the training that takes place on campus right now in ter uh, for machine shop is done during IAP, and that's done by mechanical engineering. So we have the a class that we teach in mechanical engineering that is the same as the Egerton Center. And if you take it in mechanical engineering, you can go work in the Edgerton Center. If you take it in the Edgerton Center, you can come use the mechanical engineering shop. So it's the beginning of that passport idea. Um, so we, we have worked a little bit just through mechanical engineering. I run the class actually when we do the training, but we haven't been able to go beyond that. OK? Thank you, guys. Okay. Email, whoop, my email 
uh, is just my last name. It's Culpepper, C-U-L and then Pepper, just like you put on your food. Culpepper at MIT.edu. Um, if you'd like to get in touch and just talk or you think you can help or interested, let me know. All right. Thank you for that exemplary men's at Monusmanship. Joan Horvath was uh, the lady back here who was asking, up, oh, here she is. Hi, Joan, uh, about a, a makerspace online community for alumni. We had a quick huddle uh, among the MIT AA leadership right here, and uh, through the Infinite Connection, we'll be creating an online group and online presence, and that will need a SIG volunteer leader. So, Joan, if you'd be willing, here's your chance. <laughs> Uh, come on up afterwards, if you would. Thank you. Um, we now have a 30-minute break, a great opportunity to meet, network with friends, and make new ones. And of course, uh, use that uh, MIT ALC 2010 mobile app to find others that you should connect with. Uh, see your program for uh, which room your next session will be in, and that'll be at 1045. Thank you very much.